All right, guys, we are back with Sonic Re Revolution with the uh, the the uh, creative team behind the Sonic Boom TV series. Uh, we got Alan Denton, uh, Bill Freiberger, we got Greg Hahn, we got Sam Freiberger, and we got Jason, who's going to be running the uh, panel here today. So I'm going to turn this over to Jason and uh, have a good panel. Thank you all for coming. Um, this will be our, I think, what, post-post uh, boom inter uh, interview. It's been about two or three years since uh, Side Boom's been off the air, but there's still more Blu-rays and DVDs coming, including uh, yeah. Yeah, the volume uh, one. Uh, really? Volume one it's right funny, there, it's right funny you mention uh, that. I wanted to uh, announce Sonic season, Sonic, Sonic Boom season three. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Hmm. All right, we got um, <laughs> Volume 2 also on DVD and on Blu-ray for the first time, the complete Season 1. Yeah. Uh, nine hours content there. Nine hours. Well, like well, that's a good value. Five, and uh, Season 2, Volume 1 is available also on DVD for about $10, or so you, you might be able to find it for 15 with the little action figures going on it. To you. Okay, it's been about uh, two years since uh, Boom's officially ended, and um, so I guess this is the uh, first question would be, what has everyone been up to since uh, being off the show outside of the quarantine that everyone's been uh, uh, dealing with from since 2020? Is there any new projects that you can talk about? Yes and no. Yes, there are new projects. No, I can't talk about them. <laughs> I'm starting a new show next week. I'm probably not supposed to uh, go into any specifics about it. But during quarantine, I actually I took off from Camp Cambodia for most of that whole ordeal. I spent about a year in Cambodia, actually. And that was, that was a pretty wild ride. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, Greg and I, we, uh, uh, what can we talk about? Well, we wrote for Unikitty, we wrote for Lego Monkey Kid, uh, and we have been developing a couple of shows at places that you've heard of, uh, and I'm also nervous to talk about them. Yeah, we also uh, wrote for some shows that were not that haven't aired yet, but we don't know when they're going to be showing up, but uh, there's a show called... Uh, the Twisted Timeline of Sammy and Raj that's officially announced. We're allowed to talk about that. We wrote a bunch of episodes of that. And we also wrote for an upcoming Transformers cartoon show called Transformers Bot Bots, which uh, should be, I think it's a Netflix Hasbro production. So it'll be on Netflix at some point, but we don't know when. And uh, you can buy toys of that kind of, kind of stuff right now. It's Target or Five Below or anything. So that's kind of cool. Awesome. I've seen some uh, animation of Lego Monkey Team, and that was just incredible. Uh, oh, yeah, that animation. Incredible. Yeah. Really cool. Uh, looking back, what have been some of your uh, fondest memories on working on the show? Fondest memories? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll probably go with. Uh, I, I enjoyed the interactions with uh, with the fans probably the most of working on the uh, just because, like, I don't know. I, I, I had never worked on a property where people cared this much uh, as, as working on a Sonic property to the point where, like, every background gag was thrown up in the wiki and everything. So I think I just like that. Like, every little tiny joke and every tiny character was noticed by someone. And that, that made me feel appreciated. For me, it was the fact that even though it was supposed to be a kid's show, we did a lot of the stuff we wanted to do, the stuff that we thought was funny, and didn't really worry for the most part about, will a kid get this? You know, I mean, uh, I always think of, uh, there's a line in Nutwork where, um, that where, where Sticks is something about draconian overlords, and I feel like that, that to me is, is the show. That to me is what we try to achieve, be funny, but don't write down, and you know. So that was that's 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 my fondest memory of the show was what we were allowed to do. Yeah, I'll piggyback on what Bill just said, and you know, the fact that we had Bill as a showrunner really contributed to why we were allowed to kind of push the limit a little bit. Because um, I think other other showrunners might have been a little more hesitant, but Bill wanted to continue doing what he does best, and that's right 
you know, sitcom level comedy stuff that's that's accessible to both adults and and to kids too. And, and the fact that we got to kind of push the envelope a bit and make jokes that maybe kids don't get on their first viewing, but you know, they'll watch, they'll buy these Blu-rays and DVDs and a couple years down the line, they'll find more jokes and more things that they like about it. A lot of a lot of the, um, the the writing situations would be you know would, someone would pitch something that was clearly unusable, and I would say no, we can't do that, and then I would start to giggle, and I think about it more. I say, can we do that? And they say, yeah, we can do it. That's pretty much how it went down every time. Uh, that's pretty accurate. And for for me, I would say my favorite. Uh, memory from the show would have to be the, I think the records because just the instant gratification of getting to write uh, new jokes and have the actors say them right away we, we always had a lot of fun I think uh, for sure okay um, speaking of we're going to talk about censors and such what are the challenges of working on a you know on this this wouldn't be a censor but it's funny um, what are the challenges of working on a CGI show versus traditional animation where you know in regular animation, they can just draw whatever they want and you can go anywhere where CGI C because it's rendered. CGI is, CGI is very much like um, you know, claymation. It has the worst elements of animation and the worst elements of live action. You have to build a set in the computer. You can't build a hundred sets. You can't, you can't have a one-off joke. Like, it, and sometimes you learn to use that to your benefit. Like, we had Soar the Eagle as a motivational speaker, and we needed a newscaster, and I said, well, he seems like a newscaster. He could be a guy that's got this motivational speaking thing on the side. A newscaster, theoretically, could talk about, you know, what he's done to get where he is and how you can have the power of positive thinking. And so he would become that. And there were characters that we, we, that we wouldn't reuse the design. We'd literally have that character have a larger, um, a larger role in the world, basically. So... CG, it, it has problems because we get one character per episode, and if we can do a show without a character, maybe we can have two characters for an episode we really need it. Early on, one of the original scripts, um, it was the one, it was uh, My Fair Stixie, which had written in before we got into production, it was written, and it had like eight guest cast characters. And we had to end up using those characters over and over and get our value out of them because they had already started production on that script before I came on board. I never would have done that many characters in one episode. But yeah. Lady War was in that one, and, uh, and we were able to use her as a regular instead of a one-off. Yeah, if anyone ever that, wondered why there are four, yeah, four aristocrat characters on Sonic Boom, that's like more than, than the show really needs. And it was just because... Yeah. Because that one episode right. needed a bunch of background. Yeah, yeah. But from, a, from a production standpoint, it could make things a little more difficult because certainly when we were trying to edit it, or it, there, there were sometimes fewer options and sometimes oddly more options with the fact that it was uh, 3D. Usually fewer options. Uh, where and uh, also just the fact that you're kind of dealing with a lot of the. Uh, issues that come up with live action of just, oh, we're dealing with physical sets and a lot of the issues that come up with animation so not a whole lot of the benefits of yeah. uh, it can, yeah, it can sometimes restrict what you can do uh, I, somehow we got over a hundred uh, stories out of it yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah three great episodes <laughs> yeah. Right, and um, then there was there was, you know, the, back to the CGI thing, like the if we wanted to like add a hat to a character or put them in a separate outfit that was like creating a whole new character from scratch so that would often take over uh you know uh, uh, what we would normally want to put a whole new character in we'd sometimes have to just be like well i guess amy can't have a hat in this episode because yeah yeah okay um well there was a uh, stat audio static issue but it looks like it was solved uh, it's now yeah, that's um, way better yeah, yeah. Uh, so it was um, my new camera. I switched to a different microphone. It got better. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's good there. Um, a lot better. Thanks, Bill. Since we're on the topic of CGI and rendering, was there a scene that you had written that was that they just had to refuse right out because it would have been too expensive to render? 
Yeah, I remember, well, at first, in Nutwork, there was, um, I, my original script called for a hundred puppies in the mayor scene, and <laughs> they were like, you could have three. <laughs> I think we had six, actually. So, yeah, we got, yeah. Him up to, we got them up to, we got them to double their initial offer yeah. of three. It was a debate. It was six. a debate. And yeah. basically, yeah, it would have been really funny, and in, in, um, in an animated show, a, a 2D animated show, so a lot of those puppies could have just kind of been in the background, sitting on a shelf. They wouldn't have had to move. They wouldn't have had to interact. But in CG, it, it, it just would break the bank. I know uh, Sandrine, the, uh, the animation producer in France, I got a very panicked email from her about how that was not doable. <laughs> I yeah, always I thought mean, they would just be able to, like, copy-paste as far as any character goes. Like you you, you got to uh, pose them all and stuff. Like when uh, we had like five or six tails. Yeah. Well, even like crowd scenes are a whole thing. Like crowd scenes, you, if you look at them, you'll see there's characters duplicated in the crowd. Maybe yeah. maybe we recolored especially their hair. In the, in the concert scene, especially. Yeah. Uh, but in answer to your question, we had tons of like so many ideas for episodes that just never happened because they were too you know too many new locations or or you know, too many characters in different costumes or something, all the time, all the time. I wanted to do one where Eggman has an experiment go wrong and he wakes up just ahead. And <laughs> I, I'm pretty, I, I, I seem to remember that was shut down quickly because that was a big <laughs> production concern, the idea of making Eggman just ahead. <laughs> well, does he have, like, a little spider body, or is he just rolling around? Just ahead. No, just ahead. Okay. <laughs> I'm here for that. Yeah, didn't get very far. Didn't get very far at all. The CGI mustache physics weren't quite there yet. So it just, if he was rolling and the stash wasn't doing its thing, it wasn't going to quite work out. Well, you're, yeah. ma you're making a joke, but that came up so many times with the mustache <laughs> and the physics of the mustache. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there was, there was, uh, from what I understand, the mustache itself could be physically separated from the body render, correct? Or yes. No? Yeah. Yes. The it would mustache be missing. was a separate element. That's, yeah, sometimes when we would get when we were editing, we would have shots where Eggman didn't have a mustache yet. Oh yeah, yeah, that was creepy. He looked like a yeah. guy. Yeah, <laughs> it would look like Gru from Despicable Me. But uh, have there ever been a joke that you just couldn't get past the st censors, or has there been a joke where you were surprised well, you didn't get no, past the censors? There were no censors, real. I mean, Cartoon Network. The only notes they were allowed to give were censor notes, um, and it didn't come up very often at all. Actually, I, we wrote, I, you know, I know how to do this, so we wrote the show generally within those bounds. You know, it was more um, the networks having notes or Sega having notes or what have you, and that was more about content. We, I, I know where to walk the line with the censor. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we weren't trying to be profane. We weren't trying to do things that. I mean, we were trying to push the envelope a little as far as, like, yeah. the kind of jokes we told, but we weren't trying to, like, say things that were obscene and that maybe maybe we could just get the F word in there or something. Like, yeah. that was never that was never something although, we were trying to do. Although there is that reel that's out on the Internet of someone cut together all our quote-unquote dirty jokes, you know. I'm sorry I'm late. I was home polishing my schnauzer. Yeah. Well, but uh, That's just nonsense. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. It sounds yeah, what are you dirty. talking about? We, got, when I was we, on, got, we did get censored uh, on the Eggman Dies episode. They wouldn't let us do that. They felt that was too yes. morbid. Yeah, we, we, Sam had an episode that I really loved where Eggman fakes his own death it, like Castro in order to see who moves up in the ranks so he can slap them down to see who's going to take over. And he hides in the uh, air vent, and he gets stuck there and almost starves to death and actually almost dies. Uh, <laughs> um, and I thought that was a really funny episode to do. But Standard said, no, you can't do that because you can't do death on a kid's show. And I said, well, I mean, he doesn't actually die. He said, yeah, but you're talking about death. You know, one of the big ones where it was censorship or whatever, we weren't trying to push the envelope, but we had an episode called Knuckles of the Bully, where Knuckles realizes that he was a bully, which we didn't find anything wrong with. Like, oh, and that one just, like, Cartoon Network was like, you can't use the word bully. That's, like, we have anti-bullying campaigns, and that's, like, a, a very fraught word. And that's the episode that became counterproductive, where Knuckles realizes, comes to realize he was counterproductive, because we just could yeah. not get around that word. 
right. and, and a problem there was we submitted the first draft called Knuckles the Bully, and then every draft after that, even though we, we called it um, counterproductive, they were more they were looking is this bully is you know whereas I think if we had called it counterproductive in the beginning, it wouldn't have their their guard wouldn't have been as up for the episode as it was once they the bully was in their head. And I said, oh, we'll get rid of it. That's not a problem. But they were they were nervous from that point forward in terms of our notes. Yeah, so that was the biggest battle with censorship, and we weren't even trying to be bad. We weren't trying to slip anything through. Uh huh. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I it's just because you know I, there's no point in it. I when I was on Pee Wee's Playhouse, one of the writers in, in well, not with writers, one of the animators in I forget what what sketch it was. It was not one of the it, it was the, the, the animation se sequences. It wasn't the group I was involved with. And it might have even been a previous season. Someone had written sex in one frame in the sand in a beach scene. And it was a huge issue, you know, because someone saw it because it popped in and popped out. And it was you would think it would be subliminal, but someone saw there was something going on there. And um, and they were able to freeze frame it and it became a huge problem. So it, there's no point doing that stuff because it's not it's not the audience doesn't get anything out of it. You know, it's, it's not really subversive. Subversive is getting an idea through, you know, or doing something that's a little different. So just putting the word sex in, you know, or designing a building so it looks like a penis or something, that's just, you know, that's just Disney trying to get away with something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Disney the animators do that a lot. Uh, they, there was a yeah. quick flash from a passing window, I remember that. Yeah, um, yeah. Was there an episode that you had uh, struggle, uh, struggled with when it came to writing it out? Like, uh, have you have you had to accidentally write yourself into a corner at all? Oh, man. I don't well, remember I kind of, struggling, but I'll, oh, you can talk, Bill. Go ahead. I was just going to say, and you guys can, can chime in on this, that we did such a thorough job breaking each story that the, you know, we, we solved all those problems in the even before the outline. And then the outline was just converting a beat sheet to prose, and the script was converting the prose to um, a screenplay format. And then, of course, you know, you do rewrites. Some this doesn't work, that doesn't work. But I don't think I, I can't recall. Maybe you guys can remind me. Was there an episode where we got to the script? I mean, sometimes a writer would hand in a script, we do a major rewrite. But something we said, I don't know what to do here. What do we do? I don't recall any instances. Yeah, I, I mean, like, I, I recall just really being annoyed with ourselves. Anytime we wrote something like a riddle without actually figuring it out, we're like, oh, there's a riddle, and they figure it out in some weird way, and we just, like, don't, fig don't figure it out in the outline, and then we're just stuck trying to, like, yeah. come up with a, a riddle uh, in, in the temple or something. That was, yeah. that stuck we, out we... to me the most. We really got in a groove as far as, like Bill said, like figuring everything out in the outline phase so that the script phase wasn't so difficult. I would say if anything was more of a challenge, it was when we did that four-parter. And I think Bill had originally envisioned it as like a three-parter and we had to kind yes. of pad out and figure out like where, where, where is there another part or what, what do we need to stretch out or what's missing or how do we figure right. that out? And I think ultimately it was like Alan and I ended up kind of focusing yes. and we created like episode part two yeah. ep part yeah, two part of that two of that four part new material yeah uh, in terms of in terms of outline and story part two was was a lot of new material and so the three acts of the three parts was episode the first episode the third episode the fourth episode we added that because what happens when, when i was in france working with the uh, production and someone wanted a uh, and and the network Gouli wanted a three-parter and then at some point we got back here and they said, well, you know, if we make it a four-parter, we can release it on DVD and as a movie, which of course they never did. <laughs> but they said, now we need a four-parter. And so we had to stretch it out into a, a, another episode. Yeah, much like all those new costumes and weapons and vehicles that we put in that they could release as merchandise if they wanted to. But all, then the they never and they never and all the soccer stuff. <laughs> yes. Although the soccer was a good episode. So yeah, but but the, uh, it was only done because I think they were like, we need soccer stuff because we want to make yeah. soccer toys and soccer Sonic shirts. 
and then none of that actually happened. You know, but soccer is very popular. That's why it was a simple matter of turning it into break into electric boogaloo. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, there are a lot of um, like fan projects out there. Like if you've been watching the Sonic uh, Revolution Convention, there's a lot of little fan animations now. But now there's an upcoming uh, Project M, which is basically uh, they're planning to do their own uh, Sonic Boom CGI episodes. Uh, how do you feel about the fan creations uh, such as uh, Project M? Uh, or is that uh, something oh, you yeah. can talk about? If they want to do it, it doesn't seem very productive to me, but they, you know, they want to do it. I mean, you yep. got to encourage fan art. I mean, like, the, the fan community is great, and it keeps kind of all of this stuff you know, relevant in some way, and we appreciate all that. And if, and, you know, if they love something, you know, feel free to do that. But, I, I mean, in general, I would say it's more productive to create your own original stuff than to than to do this stuff. But I think this is a good, like, it's a good, like, way to kind of test your abilities, to kind of, you know, to fir if you're just first trying to break into being an animator or being a writer or being a cartoonist or any of that, a lot of people, including, like, Tyson Hess, for example, started out by doing things they were fans of. So... You know that yeah. I think that's what I think that's where it's valuable, but it's going to be ultimately be more valuable to people, I think, to do their own original content. But yeah. well, I I I'm all for it, provided the episode they make is titled "The Last Resort." <laughs> uh, I get well, that, uh, every other except for Sonic Boom, every Sonic uh, series has had one episode called "The Last Resort" in some. I, I guess I just don't know why someone would want to sit there for a year animating something that is just like, 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 why would you, like, why would you do that to yourself? Why would you torture yourself that way? I mean, the, the only reason, the, uh, the only reason people. that, but the only reason that, like, you could, well, you have a whole team for something with, like, uh, Sonic Boom, so it's, yeah, I would say it's going to probably take a while if you, yeah. you don't have a lot of, and, if you're going to spend a lot of time animating something, you're might as well come up with something new that we can that we can see that's uh, yeah. that, that we can be fans everywhere. Of. And, and actually, we did have a last resort episode, but we didn't know of that tradition. Yeah. We, you know, we called it insanity because we didn't know about that. We did a resort episode. It, Sam, yeah, it's unfortunate. Would you be willing to declare insanity's alternate title to be the last resort? No, it's like no. What, would you no. Go, would you go to a Michelin star chef's restaurant and ask him for ketchup? <laughs> no, you can't change. You can't change my episodes. <laughs> uh, okay. Um. What well, has been your I favorite? Just, I'm sorry. I just wanted to point out that behind me here, this is where we wrote every episode of Sonic Boom. This is the this was the writers' room for Sonic Boom, my office. So, you know. I thought I thought that would be interesting to the people watching. <laughs> I, I think I think it's a big letdown. Is what it is. I think I, I think uh, I think you just took the wind out of everyone's sails. They imagined a nice writers' room. Yeah. <laughs> and now and now they know what it is. Yeah, our hovel. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. Uh, what has been your favorite uh, joke or gag that you've written for the series? Oh, so uh, many that I like. Yeah, I love the uh, the vector um, the stakeout joke that Greg and I wrote. Mm -hmm. uh, just you know, cut, cut in. They they've been waiting a long time. Ah, oh, we've been waiting forever. Stakeouts are never like this on TV. There's just two lines of dialogue, and then they see their guy. And he goes, "Well, life's not like TV. There he is." There he is. You know, yeah. I, yeah. I have no <laughs> notes on that joke. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know. There are so many that so many that I. Love. That make me laugh. A lot of obviously a lot of the um, meta humor makes me laugh, where they talk about what a shitty show would do, and then they're in the middle of doing it. You know, or why can't companies think of new stuff instead of always bringing up the same old characters in tired situations? Those kind of jokes always I always enjoy. Yeah, there's so uh, many. I agree. So. There's so many jokes we could point to, and I don't even know where to start. I'll 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 just say, just for the sake of answering the question, we put a bunch of New Jersey references in that four-parter, like about <laughs> jug, about like jug handles. Oh, and like the fact that we got to name a robot city in the clouds like Morristown. 
<laughs> then, and then later Roboken, which is another reference to like a New Jersey town. It, it's stupid stuff like that that makes me really smile when I go back and watch the show. Yeah, yeah. Another one I like is um, when Sonic gets the ticket and he says, uh, I'll fight it in court, but I don't know if got to go fast is technically a medical condition. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I have to say, I'm so happy with most of our show that it's hard to... Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. The the Morris most of town it. thing that Greg mentioned that that's also very good because they asked for like a cool name for the robot city again for merchandise. <laughs> give it a cool name, and then we named it Morris Town. And then throughout the episode, they keep going like, "Wow, you didn't name it something cool like Robotopolis <laughs> or like you know Skytopia or anything." Like we just keep throwing out good names that they would have been so happy with. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what kind of advice can you give to aspiring writers? Find another career. Oh. <laughs> that's reductive. That's reductive. Come on, that's hacky at this point. That's ha but that's so hacky <laughs> at this point. But, okay, but the, 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 real, the real advice, though, is you got to just do it and not be ashamed when it's terrible. Write stuff and, like, don't be discouraged when it's bad because it's, at first it's going to be very, very bad. Everyone starts out a bad writer. But you got to get through the bad writing and you got to have the strength to get through the bad writing to get to the part where now you're a good writer because it'll happen quicker than you uh, expect if you if you keep doing it. But you gotta keep doing it. You gotta have an eye for the craft. You gotta be like understanding what makes a good story. You gotta have the dialogue moving in an interesting direction and be compelling. And that's gonna happen more and more. Don't yeah. way around. Do it. The only way even, out is through, you gotta do it. And even good writers or great writers like the people on this panel <laughs> we, write re we write really, I mean, like, you can write a really bad first draft. In fact, that's like a great way to get started. Write your first draft, do your outline first, and then when you have to put it into script form, write the worst version of it possible. Get it down so that way you have a skeleton to play around with so you can then punch it up and make it better. Just write, ah, and then he says something funny here, and this is the line where she does this thing. Put something there, placeholders, so that when you go back and do your next pass and your next pass, the, it's easier because something's already on the page. Yeah, and and on top of that, Greg yeah. mentioned always have an outline. Don't try writing a script without an outline. You're going to fall off the end of the earth. Yeah, you don't want to be, uh, if it's a feature, you don't want to be 60 pages in and realize you don't have an ending and there's no way to end this thing. So you do it in the outline form. Um, and you know, there are two schools there because I know Eric Summers, uh, who writes a lot of the Marvel movies now, his whole thing was, I write a script in a day and then I spend two months revising it. Um, I, on the other hand, I go very slowly and I, um, I, I usually when I type the end, I don't go back very much. I, I, I'm, I've done all the rewrites as I move forward. But you know, people have different you know different ways they work. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, when I, the script the script that got me my first job was a Simpson spec script, and we wrote my partner and I at the time wrote it in ten days. We typed the end and literally sent it to his agent to sell, and the first person who read it hired us, and it was just because we kept going back and kept doing stuff as we went along. Um, but that's just the way I prefer to work. Other people do it differently. All right, I'm going to start sending this over to the uh, panel room for uh, fan Q&A now. Um, first okay. one is from Crafter. Uh, who was your favorite of the minor characters, like, I guess, the villagers and such? Give me Dave comedy the intern. Chip? Oh, hmm. comedy chimp, yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Yeah, Dave the intern. I mean, really, the minor characters are characters that we really clicked with, especially because they were our they were our original characters. Like any time it was a character from the original Sonic, you know, it was fun to play around with Sonic. It was fun to play around with Amy and Vector and Tails and Knuckles. And but you know, we got to make up Tommy Thunder. We got to make up Sore the Eagle and Dave the intern and all of these obscure characters. So. I don't who's who's our favorite. I guess Dave the intern kind of became the de facto like yeah. sixth biggest character on the show or seventh after Eggman, right? Yeah. So Dave was obviously a, a, a big one. 
the guys on Twitter, uh, Sonic the Cosplayer, he's currently doing a uh, Dave the Intern Funko Pop and putting that together. Oh, I'm yeah. aware. I, I was really poking him in private messages going, like, you going to finish that? Uh, I, yeah, I did I too. I want it. Sonic Cosplayer. Are there going to be multiples? Or are there going to be multiples or just one? Is he making it in his in I think his he's doing a 3D he... printer and he's just painting it out. I think he's just got one. Uh, or at least one or two. Yeah. We're not, we're not, but, you know. Not sure I just wanted is. to see some of those old bootleg Sonic <laughs> Boom toys. Around. Everybody watching this, shoot him a message on Twitter <laughs> and encourage him to finish those Dave the Intern Pop vinyls. Hmm. Maybe <laughs> yeah. I can make a little like bootlego figure. A friend of mine gave me the sticks. <laughs> One up here. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> You don't have to go out of your way for this this freaking thing. <laughs> so and pop uh, finals apparently are on sale, according to Sam. All pop what? vinyl characters. Apparently, the pop vinyl characters are on sale for Sam. If you look in the background in the oh. video store, there. Oh, oh yeah, it's special a offer for pop vinyl. Yeah, that's, I can do that because I don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, let's see it's what's going on pop here. Pop vinyl. Um, one uh, uh, insert Discord here asks, uh, "Who inspired the Justin Bieber character?" Well, well oh, that's guess what that's pretty obvious. David Cassidy. Oh, da David Cassidy for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wait, what? Yeah, Greg, uh, Greg, we we wrote that uh, episode. Uh, yeah. I think that started. We wrote that as like a, a, at first that was like a regular show type of idea, wasn't it? Like the, um, just the idea that they would all get hypnotized by the music and and yeah, then the power like of a... rock and roll. Um, but but if I remember correctly, Justin Bieber may have been referenced in a very early episode. Yeah. I think you know, comedy chimp says, and our guest is, and tomorrow our guest will be so and so, so and so, and Justin Bieber, which might. I, I don't know. It might have been the very, very early. It might have been the pilot, even. Yeah, yeah. it was because we called him Dustin Beaver, and uh, mm -hmm. and you said we've got a Justin Beaver, and that's when we realized we're not as clever as we think we are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and um, Lucas uh, Bradley asks, what was the inspiration behind Sticks the Badger? Sticks the Badger was created yeah, before any of us got on board. But you you basically built her whole personality, right, Bill? Yeah, yeah. Um, but she would she would the character when I inherited her was she was a a badger that lived alone in the woods, and Amy met her and they became friends. But she was supposed to be the one that had all these skills from from being a survivalist kind of character, and then I just made her the paranoid um, conspiracy gut nut. Um, yeah, because um, she existed in uh, she existed in Sonic Boom: Rise of Lyric, a game that I'm yeah. sure everybody watching has played and loves. <laughs> um, and so Styx was like a very minor character in that, but in the development of that game, that's when the conversation about the show happened. Yeah, she was, and Styx was added to the cast then. She was a and, completely different character in that game. She was like a cave woman almost. It was a completely yeah. different personality. I ex in that. I extrapolated that out to be someone who she was, she was a cave person because she didn't like society and she didn't trust the government. Um, and so I, I kind of molded the character in my own image. Um, but yeah, I inherited that character. Now I know you're saying in a previous convention that there's a lot of Alex Jones in there. <laughs> or is there well, there's Alex Jones in the Nutwork episode. She kind of becomes more of an Alex Jones thing, but she, yeah, she's kind of, you know, I mean, I think a lot of her crazy behavior is now normal for 30% of the country. <laughs> you know? I, um, let's see. Uh, Ender Isaac Core asks if you can make a new Sonic Boom game, <clears throat> uh, what kind do you think you'd make? If we could make a game. Oh, man. Uh, you got one, Sam? 
Well, oh, this one that was successful this time, ideally, that would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe we let Big Red and Button do what they wanted to do in the first place, and on the engine, it yeah. worked right. And oh then maybe the game would have just been great. Yeah, it would have been a very different thing. Yeah. We yeah, were at know. the the Big Red Button offices. Like, we went there for a week to work on the game script, and they showed us, like, the, the game in development. It looked good. I remember we all watched their their footage and and we were it was in the cry engine and it just looked it looked cool it was unfinished of course but we were like oh this is gonna be a good game, um, and then the game that came out didn't really resemble uh, the game that we were watching. One I understand yeah. it was meant for like PS3 and Xbox 360. And yes. Right? And during exactly. that time, uh, Sega got a Nintendo got a Sonic exclusive contract with Sega, and so they had to do it on the underpowered uh, Wii U. Actually, yeah, I think it was meant for PS4, Xbox One, so that would make more sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah. they it just was, couldn't, uh, they just couldn't handle it. It was very obvious. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I played through the entire game uh, once, and when you got to like wow. the village area with um, Percy, uh, it was empty. There was just nobody around the village <laughs> at all. It was kind of like that on the show too. <laughs> our, our village is very underpopulated. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, somebody said no. They they want a Dave the Intern spinoff game. <laughs> oh well, that would be pretty sweet. Yeah, like a nice. like a Diner Dash, except you just do a bad job. It's like Burger Time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's what just you do, I think. It's eight bit. Do it eight bit. Yeah. Well, actually, you know, if you're gonna, if I was gonna be in charge of the game, it would be some Tetris like game because I, that's all I play are these different these different variations of Tetris. It would be Mean Bean Machine. But I played the Mean Bean Machine a lot. Thing. I play, I played Doctor Mario, which is kind of interesting. So I don't know why a plumber is prescribing medication, but <laughs> like, clearly Nintendo doesn't care about the consistency of the characters as much as some of the other people I've worked with. Well, I mean Sega itself, it's not uh, even the official Sonic video game canon is not quite a canon. It can change at any uh, exactly. moment. Exactly. Not, That's not like making you a doctor. <laughs> right. not, not like making him a doctor or uh, what's the other, or he's a I guess everyone does racing things but no. uh, you know Mario racing you know Mario Kart racing basically defined the genre and everyone else is just copying that but when they did it it was you mm. know why is the plumber now a race car driver after having been a doctor <laughs> you know it's just whatever whatever makes a good game is what should be important I mean, one of his first uh, jobs out in the NES was a referee for Punch Out. Uh, also, fights Dennis Hopper technically in the '90s. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, this is from Sonic Fan. It's for Greg Hahn. I guess last Which one? year. Sonic uh, Fan, huh? Yeah. Interesting. Um, <laughs> it says last year uh, you said you disliked Charmy. I guess this must have been on Twitter because he's an oh, obnoxious yeah. bee. And yeah. she what and may, he or she wonders if that still stands. Yeah, no, Charmy's the worst. <laughs> the worst character. It's the worst character maybe of all time. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't want to say that, but I no, I didn't like Charmy the Bee. I thought it was annoying. I'm glad we didn't have to write it into the show. Or if we yeah. did, you wouldn't like what we did with it. <laughs> <laughs> it Tails would have made like Charmy would have made Tails look super cool. Super yeah. masculine, yeah. <laughs> Let's see, uh, Ouija, Ouija Prower asks, how would you feel about a Medburger slash Sonic drive-in promotion that gives you a Councilman McMet toy with every Medburger purchase? Councilman oh, McMet? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, he's got pencil-pushing action. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that would um, be great. It would like be great. Show. But the fact that, that Sega is completely abandoning Sonic Boom makes it seem like it almost would not happen. You know, yeah, to, I was surprised, I guess, earlier this year, the uh, Sonic Dash 2, Sonic Boom, we thought it was completely dead, and then they added uh, Vector to mm -hmm. the uh, list of characters you can unlock, which really surprised me, because I thought that was to be completely dead by now. Yeah, the the funny thing about uh, Councilman McMeh, in the script we had to write McMeh, M-A-C, meh. Because they said MC meh is too close to McDonald's, even though when spoken it sounds exactly the same. Mm -hmm. 
I guess if you yeah. had your closed caption on, we could have gotten really sued. No, oh, it's Councilman <laughs> Mac there. <laughs> Uh, okay, and see, and there is a core asks if you're allowed to say anything. Is there anything that went unused and didn't make it into the show? Of course, that's the mm -hmm. nature of shows. Last time we talked about, or I think the, the last live convention we talked about, there was an episode written that we ended up not using because we made um, the finale a two parter. Um, but that was um, Eggman marries. Lady Walrus for her money. Yeah, yeah. So you've one. still got that script kicking around somewhere, probably. Oh, right? I That's... have everything on my computer. I have, I have it yeah. all. Yeah, oh, that was... Out. Let's see it. <laughs> you can put uh, it on there. Uh, It'd be awesome. Think it's your intellectual really property, it. right, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't mine. I didn't write it, and we never did a rewrite on it. So I don't know that I would ever send it out for that reason. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have the... Uh, Sonic Boom writing staff seal of approval. <laughs> All right. You know, it's funny you you brought that up because I remember last year something was mentioned about uh there was a there was a particular episode that that might have been pitched but y'all saw but y'all said that it might not have worked and now you kind of regret it. it's about the uh, uh about the wall being built around Gogo -Go Village. That was Gogo -Go -Go yeah. Village, yes. Yeah. That was Sam's and and I foolishly foolishly said. That's going to be out of the news by the time this thing airs. And, and you know, it's uh, funny because I did. There is another children's show that did do that joke, and that would be All Hail King Julian. Yes, yes. I think they won an Emmy for I, it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oops. Ouch. That was our Emmy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ours would have been just as profound. Yeah. God damn it. <laughs> well, it would have been my Emmy and Sam's Emmy. You guys wouldn't have gotten oh, yeah. it. You didn't, have, you didn't need to write it or have a high enough title. Well, that's true. But um, but I think All Hail King Julian was perceived within the community as a higher quality show. Incorrectly I, um, perceived. Incorre incorrectly, perhaps. But I um, when I first you know I got into the Television Academy and um, – was voting for Emmys, I submitted the show I was working on. And then when the Emmy book came, the way they did it then, they got this book to of every show that was submitted, and then people nominate them. And I skipped through all these other bad shows, and I said, oh, Frasier, that's a good show, or whatever it was, or Cheers. And I realized people are going to skip over the show I submitted. And I realized that, you know, it has to be perceived as a good show in the community before it has a chance. You're not going to get a show that no one's heard of. They're never going to see the show, and they're never going to think it deserves an Emmy. And Sonic Boom, being on Boomerang, would not would, would have fallen under the radar. What's wrong with a 6 p.m. time slot on Boomerang? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on Saturday. <laughs> Saturday. Yeah. Everybody's got Boomerang. It's only on, like, the gold package or something. <laughs> yeah. In order to get it. Uh, that was my uh, one issue with the show. It was so hard to catch up on because you know, it kept jumping from here to there. I think that's the time I had to yeah. watch it on the internet in some form or another. Yes. Uh, Which we don't uh, encourage. No. We don't no. encourage. Well, I mean, um, legally, I think there's. I think Hulu had Hulu had it oh, on. Yeah, yeah Hulu yeah. was the only one I could actually watch it on because you know I couldn't get access to Boomerang, so I had to wait for it to be on Hulu. And Hulu was good about it. I think it was always the next day that coming on. And it's still on there. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, apparently it's doing very, very well on there. <laughs> oh, really? From what I understand from the people who have, um, you know, a stake in, in it doing well. They said they were very excited to renew it when the first contract ran out. All right. Okay, uh, it's doing very nice. Yeah, I thought I was stupid. Us at the Academy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, I okay. don't think I've much of everything. Somebody has what's everybody's favorite episode. I think we might have covered that either this, yeah. this time or Mine last is not time. work. Yeah. Uh, yeah, give me Robots from the Sky Part 2. I'll take uh, uh, the, uh, the boy band one. I'd say for, uh, for actual... Uh, like actually being a smart 
episode that I'm proud of, not work, but it's for being a stupid episode, I'm proud of uh, uh, Victory, the soccer one. <laughs> Uh, my favorite's just a guy, and I know a lot of people don't care for that one, but actually, really I mean, enjoyed it. that one's uh, that one's untouchable to me because Bill put the the live action sequence in it and stood by <laughs> it the whole time because yes. it took it took like the whole year before they actually shot that live action sequence. I think they were hoping that you would take it out or something. Yeah, yeah, I I fought for the live action sequence. I think that's uh, going to wrap, wrap it up for now. I'm out of uh, questions here. Thank you all, uh, everyone, for coming to this uh, panel. I really enjoyed having you guys. Yeah. It was a pleasure Great, as always. Man. Looking forward to doing it live yeah. next year. Yes, we look, we look forward. Yeah. yeah, we definitely look forward to seeing you guys live next year. So. Yeah. Uh, Sounds good. good. We'll be around. Yep. All right, guys, uh, that wraps it up for the Sonic Boom panel coming up next. I believe it's Sage. So stick around as we got the guys from Sage coming in to talk about their event. If you guys have more questions, hit us up on Twitter or something. We're happy to answer them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi, everybody. Bye.